Guys, let's just ban injuries. You are Locked On Hoosiers, your daily podcast on the Indiana Hoosiers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome into another week of Locked on Hoosiers. I'm your host, as always, Jacob Rood. I want to thank you for making us your first listen this Monday, every day of the week. Honestly, uh, we are your one and only daily one-stop shop for everything IU Athletics. I'm going to put it out there right now. This is not going to be a fun episode. IU was uh, bitten pretty badly by the injury bug to two very prominent players, Dexter Williams, I'm sure a lot of you saw on Saturday, Grace Berger. I don't know how many of you saw, but both seem to have suffered pretty serious injuries over the weekend. Uh, We got to talk about them. Uh, It's like I said, it's not fun, but That is the state of IU Athletics right now. I promise we will end the show with a very fun note as IU Soccer is moving on to the Elite Eight. Let's start with the football game. Um, A a game that was really just kind of marred by Dexter Williams' injury. It's a real bummer for a number of reasons. Dexter Williams looked like someone that... um, was figuring some things out, had an exciting future, had given IU a spark offensively, and was somebody that was had already battled through a, a leg injury uh, in the in the past. You felt awful for him when he crumbled to the ground on Saturday. It looked really bad. Uh, Tom Allen said after the game that it was a knee injury, but it was not a, an ACL injury. They had an air cast out. Air casts really only come out for like compound fractures. Um, thankfully, nobody showed the replay. I am a very big stickler of not showing traumatic injuries on replay. Uh, so very much kudos to the production crew, the broadcast team for not showing that. I think the reaction of Dexter himself, of the offensive linemen around him, was enough to tell us that that was a very bad injury. But yeah, um, if if you're kind of putting it in the context of the game, it it changed the game entirely. Uh, IU looked lively uh, before that with Dexter Williams in there. Jalen Lucas ripped off a big 71-yard touchdown run. The next uh, drive was uh, when Dexter Williams got hurt. But it featured a, a fourth and two reverse that uh, worked for a first down. Uh, it featured some big runs from Dexter Williams. I'm looking at the play log here. It featured a uh, pass from or to Emory Simmons or no Emory Simmons, excuse me, had the uh, reverse. Um, but yeah, ultimately it ends in the injury. Uh, that drive did and it felt like from that point on there wasn't really a chance I was winning that game. I I don't know how teammates mentally recover from that for the rest of the half. I was still just kind of in shock or, or stunned at that injury. I don't know how you could immediately mentally recover from that and try to play a football game. I, you led that game at halftime. At no point did I feel like this was a game IU was going to win. Uh, the offense w- so drastically changed under Dexter Williams the last couple weeks that bringing Connor Bazelak back in, I there was there wasn't much hope that that was going to work because you had to change so much back to what you had kind of unlearned the last couple weeks. So the end result was IU kind of stuck between these two offenses. Um, They ran the ball well, if I'm being honest, 44 times for 215 yards, but there was just no spark there. Bazelak had a touchdown and an interception. 
and Purdue's offense that we we talked about last week came to life. Um, Aiden O'Connell threw for a couple touchdowns. Charlie Jones had 143 yards on four catches for in a touchdown. I, I that second half, to be honest, played out as I kind of thought it would. And, and Purdue won going away. The 30 to 16 score line was flattering because Josh Henderson scored literally as time expired. And so the end result is a uh, four win season, four and eight season. IU improved from, from last year. And I said before the season that that was the goal to show improvement, but this wasn't like, <laughs> I, I'm trying to think of how I would phrase it. There's still a lot of questions about, this team like it wasn't this straightforward improvement where you can see things are back on track and point at certain areas that you know are improving i don't really know what to make of iu football going into this offseason um it's not a conversation i can squeeze into the rest of the segment or we're probably going to talk about it tomorrow um but there's a lot of uncertainty around the program even after a season when which you improved and there were some positives. Uh, I mean, the team didn't give up. And I think that's one of the biggest ones, especially after how last season ended when they kind of let go of the rope, when things started spiraling and the end of the year was ugly. The Michigan state game was an, it was a clear example that this team didn't do that. In the first half of this game, or until Dexter Williams' injury was an example of that. I, outside of that, it's going to be interesting. There's a number of key young pieces that they're going to need to retain and build around with Williams, Jalen Lucas, obviously Deshaun McCullough, Donovan McCauley. They need to keep those guys, make them key parts of the uh, offense and defense moving forward and build around them, but... There are a lot of questions about this program moving forward. It, it was a funky season. Um, I, I'm i not really sure if you would have told me at the beginning of the year if I would have taken four and eight. Um, I don't know. I think I probably would have. But the way it all played out, the seven-game losing streak right in the middle of it, it, it leaves a sour taste in your mouth, even with, uh, even with how things ended. So... Like I said, we'll dive into the football team a little bit more later this week and, and try to digest what this program did and what it's going to need to do going into the offseason. As I said, Dexter Williams was not the only one to suffer a bad injury. Uh, Grace Berger also went down with a knee injury on Friday in Las Vegas as part of a Absolute calamity of a weekend for IU women's basketball. There's a lot to talk about in this next segment about what happened in Vegas for the Hoosiers over the weekend. Before we do that, though, let's talk about Upside. We've talked about this app a lot. I cannot recommend it enough, guys. I literally used it this past weekend or uh, for the holidays. It's a simple app. Uh, it, it's, it's giving you money doing things you already do, whether it's pumping gas, whether it's buying groceries, whether it's going out to eat, you simply down or download the upside app. Um, you look for offers around you. I used it for gas. There's a gas station down the road, drove to the gas station, claimed the offer, checked in, pumped the gas as normal. The next day I got a, an email from upside telling me, uh, money had been added to my account. It was free, and I didn't even have to do anything different than what I would have normally done. So to get started, download that Upside app. Use our promo code LOCKED and get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of at least $10 using promo code LOCKED. Let's also talk about LinkedIn, the great sponsors over there. These guys uh, help every new potential hire that feels like a high stakes wager for small businesses. They help you nail those hires with 100% certainty. 
that's why you guys need to go check out LinkedIn Jobs. Uh, they help you find the right candidates faster and for free. It's simple. You post the job to uh, LinkedIn. You share it on your account. There are simple tools like screening questions that help filter out uh, the candidates so that the right ones are there for you. Makes the process simpler and easier. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find those qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Thanks for making Locked On Hoosiers your first listen today. For your second listen, check out Locked On Sports today. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports Today, available on this app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. Let's talk about the Hoosiers uh, and what they did in Vegas. Lead off with the Graceberger injury. Some of you may have seen it. Some of you may not have. Very early on in Friday's game against Auburn, um, a player basically fell into Graceberger's knee. She went down on the court in tears. Uh, there were sporadic reports. We mentioned that this was a subscription only service that was $30 to watch the games. There wasn't a lot of reporters there. We're going to get to why here in a minute as well, but it sounded very serious. There were pictures posted of her on the bench, ice on her knees, but very visibly crying or, or having cried. It, it was very emotional. Uh, Terry Moran got choked up after the game talking about the injury. Officially, we don't know what it is, or as I'm recording this, we don't. Indiana was going to come back to Bloomington, get some MRIs then. As you're listening to this, it, it may be out, so you can go check our Twitter. I'm going to keep that updated on Monday with whatever news we get from her and from Dexter Williams. But ultimately... Uh, she was on crutches. She was kind of limping around for the rest of the weekend. She was doing some rehab. Um, that is a good sign. That doesn't mean it wasn't or isn't an ACL injury. Uh, you can do kind of prehab, I believe is what it is a name for it. Uh, even before you have an, uh, surgery on an ACL, um, it's hopeful. It gives you reason for hope that she was doing stuff, but it does not rule out that she uh, could have suffered an ACL injury. So send the good vibes that way. Hope for the best for Grace Berger. Uh, but that was the beginning of a, a, a terrible weekend for IU in Vegas, not related to the games at all. IU won both games, but that felt secondary or tertiary to everything else that played out. Uh, the state of this tournament was an absolute calamity. Uh, it was the fire festival of women's basketball. Um, I think the mo most egregious example of how ill-prepared everybody was, the, the people that put this tournament on, the promoters, the directors, everybody involved with, with putting this tournament on um, should hold their heads in shame and, probably should face some type of repercussion for this. Uh, but the most egregious example was on Saturday. I used game tipped off almost an hour late because an Auburn player went down hard in, in their game. They needed somebody, an EMT, to come out, uh, and there was not one on scene. This game was being played in a ballroom in the Mirage. Uh it's almost inexplicable how poorly put together this tournament was. Uh, eventually, 40, 45 minutes later, EMTs did arrive. Uh, that was only after a fire and rescue team came at first and then realized they needed an EMT. That fire and rescue team came after 30 minutes, so there was no rush at any point for any of this. Uh, Terry Morin had a quote on it, quote, any good tournament has EMTs, all of that, medical professionals on site. It wasn't the case. Another big miss for this tournament. There were a lot of things that should have been better and they just weren't. That was a little bit frustrating. If the shoe was on the other foot and that was my kid, I would be very frustrated. I was very frustrated having to watch that moment for Auburn. 
I discussed it with our staff. Uh, do we feel safe? I talked to my AD. He talked to him, he and he wanted to make sure that we felt safe. The answer to that is yes. We felt like we were in a safe environment. It just wasn't the aesthetics that we imagined. I saw some suggestions. Grace Berger's injury was not because of any kind of unsafe environment. It was just a player falling onto her. And Terry Morin said that, that that was not a byproduct of some type of unsafe court or anything like that. But, I mean, there were plenty of other things that were absolutely insane. Uh, teams were told towels weren't being provided to them during games, that they needed to bring down hand towels from their hotel rooms if they wanted some type of towel during the game. The games, as I said, were played in ballrooms that were not remotely set up for any kind of spectator experience. There were apparently no signs throughout the casino. Uh, spectators just like weren't there. Like it, it wasn't a spectator friendly environment. Um, the, and Vegas is a, is a, is a place where the Las Vegas Aces play WNBA and they had a record number of sellouts. Like this is a women's basketball um, like environment. Like it's a place that supports it. So the idea that this was put on without really anybody even knowing is ludicrous. Um, the, the teams had to warm up in middle school gyms, which like, I guess is something that happens sometimes with, men's uh kind of multi-team events or, or tournaments but i mean with with what this was it, to me it's just another kind of inexplicable um thing that went on uh terry morin went off on on the the tournament as a whole quote i think there are probably other people that need to apologize as well for wanting us to come and play in this event that this was not what was described to us as far as what the venue was going to look like, what the setup was going to look like. What's disappointing is the aesthetics. It's not a fan friendly environment. As women's basketball coaches were trying to move the game forward, it felt like because it got so many ticks on social media that we'd taken a couple steps backward in this moment. We have an obligation to grow our game and we completely missed on this opportunity. You have a lot of really good teams that are here representing their conferences. I see all these other tournaments going on and footage of that. This was a major miss, in my opinion, in terms of helping grow this game. I can't really fathom how just inexplicable this is. Just picture if this happened to IU men's basketball and Trace Jackson Davis and those guys were told, bring towels down from your um, hotel room and you guys are going to play in a ballroom where nobody can watch the game. And uh, I mean, there were a number of other things. The Indy Star wrote a great article on it. The ESPN did as well. Um, the scoreboard, I guess, was TV screens sitting on a scores table like, there were just a number of things that were, I mean, it, it was like the fire festival. If you guys remember that it was, it was not remotely put together. Well, even a little bit embarrassing, uh, inexcusable. Um, yeah, there's a lot of people that need to need to issue some apologies. I guess the tournament director did, but that wasn't good enough. Everything that went on was not good enough in Vegas. Um, like I said, we will have updates on Grace Berger's injury status. If they come on Monday, we'll potentially talk about it on Monday's episode as well. IU, like I said, did win the games. It, it felt, I mean, they won Friday 96 to 81. They beat Memphis 79 to 64. McKenzie Holmes looked fantastic, but it's hard to really talk about that considering everything else that went on. We'll we'll talk about them later this week before they play UNC as well uh, this week in the Big Ten ACC Challenge. Let's finish on with some positives. IU soccer is going back to the Elite Eight. They get some revenge against Marshall on Sunday night. We'll dive into that, how they were able to get the win and the madness that is going on in that bracket for men's soccer. Before we do that, 
This week's thrilling moment in college football is brought to you by Nissan. The thrilling designs behind the new lineup from Nissan are intended to empower drivers in vehicles as capable as the drivers themselves. When I think of unbelievable abilities on the field for this week's thrilling moment, it has to be Jalen Lucas. That, that touchdown run was wild. Uh, I was worried <laughs> to start out the or excuse me, P Purdue drove down the field pretty easily. Uh, IU bent but didn't break defensively and hold him to a field goal. And then Jalen Lucas rips off this huge touchdown run right away on the next drive. As exciting as it gets, he was the person responsible for just about every Nissan exciting play that her thrilling moment that we talked about this season. So excited for what the future holds for him. This segment has been inspired by the thrilling new designs featured across Nissan's new lineup of vehicles pursue what thrills you in the all-new frontier armada or pathfinder available now at nissanusa.com men's soccer gets the one nil win over marshall at home in the home finale on sunday it was a game in which this scoreline flatters marshall iu dominated this game and i was very worried for most of it that uh, IU was going to regret the amount of chances they did not put away. Ultimately, they had 10 first half corners, did not convert on any of them. The 11th, the first one of the second half, they did. Coach Yeagley said they made some adjustments at halftime. Uh, they got some guys making some different runs into the box. Ryan Wittenbrink puts one back post. Brett Beebe. Absolutely dunks on Marshall, outleaps his man, uh, puts it into the back of the net. He called it the the greatest kind of goal of his life. I can't remember the exact words, but I believe it was greatest goal of his life. Um, and that was all that that was all that IU needed. Now, like I said, this should have probably been three or four nil. IU was a bit wasteful at times with some really good possession, but. They didn't let any of that stop them from dominating this game. Through the opening 60 to 65 minutes, IU was in complete control. There was about a 15-minute spell. Marshall had control. Um, it was really right after IU uh, scored. Marshall kind of responded, but there was never really anything all that threatening. IU only had to make two saves on the night. And then the end of the game, when Marshall should be pushing forward and throwing everything at IU, they couldn't. Um, kudos to Herbert Endley, uh, Tommy Mahalik, Samuel Sarver, the three forwards for Indiana. Marshall was very aware of Ryan Wittenbrink, who now has seven goals or has a goal and an assist in seven straight games. Uh, the, Marshall was very aware of him and. IU responded by going through Indeli, Mahalik, and Sarver more, and they produced a lot of very quality chances. But more importantly, at the end of the game, when Marshall should be launching the ball forward, those three continued pressing. And, and I think my favorite sequence of the game, there's about a minute left. Marshall's keepers 40 yards out of goal, trying to play the ball around to get, launch it forward. The, and there's two defenders back, and they could not get the ball forward because Mahalik, Indeli, Sarver were all pushed up, not giving them space to launch the ball forward. 30 seconds ran off the clock before they could do anything. By the time they did, the pass went long, sailed out of bounds, um, and that was that. The celebrations were kind of on from then. The refs stopped the, the game to – avoid time wasting, I guess. He didn't do that in any other point in the game, but it, it didn't really matter. It, you could kind of sense that the moment was done, that IU had had won the game. And uh, shout out to everybody at Bill Armstrong Stadium. That was a raucous crowd for the home finale, despite it being cold and windy and wet there. Um, but ultimately, IU gets the win, as I said. Uh, Marshall outshot Indiana 12-10. to 10. Indiana had six shots on goal to Marshall's two. A lot of those Marshall shots, even the couple on goal, were kind of speculative efforts. Like I said, nothing was really threatening. Uh, 12 to 1 on corner kicks in favor of Indiana. Uh, this one felt nice. 
you could see a number of IU guys were very excited to get this one. This revenge was very sweet. Brett Beebe himself was on the field when Marshall won the national title on a golden goal. He was on the field. So for him to get this goal was was very nice, very fitting, of a nice little full circle moment. And I use moving on to the Elite Eight. They are going to play UNC Greensboro, who beat number five Stanford in penalties three to one. Uh, they are the 12 seed. So the 12 seed and the 13 seed are meeting in the Elite Eight for a chance at the College Cup. Um, outside of this, it's just utter chaos. Kentucky was the one seed in this tournament, looked unbeatable the whole year. Uh, they had not lost the whole season. They beat Indiana 3 0. They lose to Pittsburgh 2 to 1 on Sunday. Pittsburgh and Portland play in their Elite Eight game. Syracuse is the highest rated seed left, number three seed. They play Vermont for their spot in the College Cup. And then Duke plays Creighton uh, for Duke as the seventh seed for their spot. Creighton beat number two Washington to get to this spot, then beat number 15 Tulsa. Uh, Duke beat number 10 FIU. Um, but top seeds are falling left, right, and center. As I said, there's only th uh, four of them left, and two of them are playing each other in UNC Greensboro and Indiana. Indiana will go to UNC Greensboro on Saturday, I believe at 630. Um for a chance at the College Cup. This has always been the hurdle for Indiana is a Sweet 16 game. When they get through this, or when they when they typically get into the Elite Eight, it's game on. IU is, I believe, 4-0 in Elite Eight games under uh, Coach Yeagley, this Coach Yeagley. So, knock on wood, but IU seems to have gotten over the, the curse. I really wanted Stanford. I wanted this to be a run of revenge. But happily take a chance against UNC Greensboro. We'll talk about them uh, later in the week. We'll do a preview as we did for the other game. But UNC Greensboro is 13-1-6. and six. If you're playing in the Elite Eight, you're a quality opponent. So IU has a chance to go back to the College Cup. Um, knock on wood, fingers crossed, but exciting time for IU soccer. Glad we ended on a high note because this wasn't a fun episode. Uh, this was a, a frustrating one, a disappointing one. Hopefully it gets better. There's a big IU basketball game this week that we'll obviously talk about. Going to try to do a crossover show with Locked on Tar Heels. UNC is a mess. Uh, they fell flat on their face this weekend, so we'll try to figure out what's going on with them uh, this week as well. But tomorrow, as I said, we'll get you some injury updates. We'll talk some IU football. Um, thanks again, though, guys, for making Locked On Hoosiers your first listen every day. For your next listen, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast, the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, wherever you get podcasts. Follow us on Twitter at LO underscore Hoosiers. Subscribe to the podcast. If you guys can, take a quick second, leave a rating and a review. Uh, I want to try to get more of those because that gets us in front of more eyes and ears. I appreciate all of you that have done it already. It's real quick. Just head to the app, five stars. You don't even have to leave a, a review if you don't want. Just that five-star rating alone helps us out a ton. Most importantly, though, guys, um, no IU game tonight. So enjoy a, a stress-free night. And as always, LEO.